On her way into the train station in Ikebukuro, Japan, Yoka Nakatomi is surprised with cheer and brought up to a skyscraper where people are celebrating the 7G launch ceremony, welcoming Yoka as the 77,777th person to arrive. The host of the Spread 7G Worldwide Committee, Pontaro Poison, asks what she expects from 7G, which should connect the world at record speeds. For Pontaro, it should be instant communication and contact with anyone, anywhere. Japan had lost in the market for establishing both 5 and 6G, but with 7G, Pontaro plans to reclaim Japan's honor. This new 7G will tap directly into the thoughts in your brain for an omni-device approach. But Yoka doesn't seem to really have any interest in this. The crowd then makes the countdown, where Pontaro prompts Yoka to press the 7G button. However, things aren't as they expected. The world and the people begin to distort until the city mixes into a disturbing jungle. Two years later, in Agano, Japan, the adult citizens have transformed into animals who still try to maintain living their normal lives. Where even this bear man, Masaharu, is apparently fighting with his wife who is a deer now, as their tastes for dinner have become night and day, so he complains about her cooking often. The city of Agano is somewhat lucky with its people becoming animals, as there are rumors of places where everyone has turned into trees. Passing by are two girls, Raimi and Akira, who get offered some curry by Granny Toucan, as long as they're willing to deal with crickets in it. And even though Raimi isn't too ecstatic, Akira thinks there's nothing wrong since bugs are nutritious. However, for Raimi, nutrition isn't the issue. She desires cuteness and adventure. Akira looks at Raimi with disgust, hearing Raimi's rampant escapism again. Or is it just excessive optimism? Head in the clouds, perhaps? Raimi doesn't like this, but before she can slug Akira, Nadeko breaks up the fight, saying no fighting, no matter what. After scolding her friends, Nadeko checks her phone to read that the food delivery caravan is arriving soon. But oddly, their friend Shizuru hasn't arrived yet. Maybe she's a little late from the depressing career consultation with Iguchi-sensei today, but it's not like there's any point in discussing a career with the world in this state. They then spot Zenjiro, a man who Granny Toucan remarks used to be tall and handsome. However, after the 7G incident, he's only able to incessantly repeat the words choo-choo and even stranger, he's the only adult in Agano that's remained human. Because all the adults here turned at the age of 21 years and 3 months and above. A depressing idea with these girls knowing they'll eventually become animals too. Masaharu comes down because he's so hungry he can hardly wait, but staring at Nariko, his animal instincts kick in, only to get slugged away by Shizuru, who scolds him. Aware once again, he's surprised that he became truly animalistic in that moment. The girls ask how Shizuru's career path meeting went, but it didn't go exactly as they expected. Shizuru's only desire at the moment is to find Yoka. Then suddenly, the sound of a song begins playing as the Black Leopard caravan arrives to deliver food to Agano's citizens. Shizuru checks with one of the drivers named Neko to hopefully find some rumors of her friend Yoka, but unfortunately, nothing has turned up on his end. Shizuru then asks to work with him, but he tells her no way because his work is too dangerous. Even with Shizuru being a second Don in Agano Jiu-Jitsu, Neko recalls the events after the 7G incident, where all the other delivery companies fell one after another. The Black Leopard continues because they're the only delivery company left, but even he knows that could end at any time. After the Black Leopard company leaves, Nariko opens up her delivery. It's a sweet myrtle plant, something she's really wanted recently for some reason. However, in the newspaper covering the plant, Shizuru is surprised to find a month-old newspaper with their friend Yoka in it. Just what is she doing in Ikebukuro? As Shizuru runs to show Yoka's grandmother the newspaper, she reflects on the event two years ago that drastically changed their world. The distance between train stations and between towns suddenly grew to impossible lengths. Not just the geography, but all the people and living things completely changed. In Agano, all the grown-ups turned into animals and while they can still reason like humans, she feels that one day they'll fully turn into animals. Shizuru arrives to show Yoka's grandmother the newspaper, where upon seeing it, she tears up. The world that transformed surprised everyone at first. They were shocked from being turned into weird animals, as well as anger and utter despair. 
A number of folks formed a survey team and ventured outside of Agano. Half of them got cold feet and came running back. The other half never returned. Shizuru returns home to her red panda mother. However, she can only think back to that day where she and Yoka had fought, and Yoka ran away. The last thing she had told Yoka being, I don't care about you anymore. That was the last time she saw her. She's had no luck searching for her since. She then spots Pochi, Yoka's dog, outside her door, and goes for a walk outside until she spots Zenjiro. A string cap falls from Zenjiro, and after Pochi smells it, they head towards the train. Shizuru pops open the train to find a conductor's cap, and when placing it on Zenjiro, he returns to his regular form and is apparently pissed at Pontaro. He had always told that guy to give up on 7G. Apparently, Pontaro ignored many researchers who had warned that the idea threatened the laws of physics, even performing a strange surgery on Zenjiro. However, Zenjiro swears he'll put an end to 7G and save Ikebukuro. However, after Shizuru shakes Zenjiro, he turns back to his worthless state of being, and putting the cap back on doesn't seem to fix it. The next day, Shizuru tells her mother goodbye, and she thanks her teacher, but ultimately, she's dropping out of school. She checks everything on the train, with Zenjiro telling her she should be fine. However, she can't leave without her three friends worried about her. With the train departing, the three friends and Pochi decide to tag along with there being 30 stops before they arrive at Ikebukuro, all traveling in hopes to find their missing friend. As they travel over the Koma River, Raimi shouts out the window staring at the beautiful serene water. She's amazed, now seeing a world outside of Agano. As the girls play in the train, they wonder when they'll be reaching Ikebukuro, all while Shizuru focuses on navigation. It used to take only a little over an hour previously. However, with the state of the world having changed, not even the Black Leopard Caravan can reach it now. As Raimi and Akira fight over how long it's going to take them, Shizuru yells at them to let her focus, sending them into a corner. They then notice the train is going a little faster, so they ask Shizuru to slow it down, but she's been trying, and this sudden roller coaster ride puts three of the girls into a panic. After figuring it out, Shizuru sighs, saying this is a lot harder than what Zenjiro had taught her. And the other three girls were surprised to hear he could turn into a total hottie for only five minutes a day, regaining complete coherency. Raimi then moves the conversation to what she's heard about Ikebukuro. Apparently the town has model scouts, butlers, as well as detectives and murderers. If they don't pay attention, they could be stabbed, run over, and scammed. She then begins panicking, realizing she left her piggy bank at home, so right now, she only has 250 yen. Shizuru offers to let her borrow, since she has 3,000 yen. However, the girls mock her a little because that isn't much at all. With the money Raimi's borrowed, she wants some boba, chicken, and French toast. However, when Nautico recommends something they can take on their long trip like canned food, Raimi isn't so excited. Luckily, Shizuru packs some supplies for survival just in case. She thought she had packed more food than they pulled out, but somehow ended up with less by bringing in a bitter melon plant? Anyways, traveling further into the fog, Raimi gets more antsy, asking when they're going to reach Ikebukuro. She begins to bicker with Akira over useless things. Nautico tries to break up the fighting, but with Shizuru sick of their nonsense, she tells them they didn't have to come. She was planning on going alone from the start. This gets the train a little silent. Then the bitter melon vines suddenly grow onto Raimi. The whole thing is growing much faster than it usually would. Pochi then starts barking after spotting something in the fog. They make a stop and Akira freaks out, thinking the being out there is Komasi, the plesiosaur said to have been living in the Koma River to this very day. Uh, it's just a guy in a swan boat. He's a little over the top, but apparently he's been traveling up the Koma River jotting down notes and doing research. Shizuru is quite surprised to learn he's from Ikebukuro, but after learning he has no idea what's going on there, they leave him and continue to make their way. Despite him warning them not to continue their journey, he gives them something useful, a map he drew. After leaving the man behind, they were somewhat glad to meet another adult human since they hadn't seen one for a while, even though he was somewhat weirder than Zenjiro. The three girls then have a heartfelt moment sympathizing with Shizuru who's been emotionally desperate to find Yoka again. Nanako even has Shizuru apologize for saying she wished they hadn't joined her for the journey. Later, 
They try starting up the train again after stopping, only to realize the water level has risen. They check the map they got from the man earlier only to see goofy odd directions they can't make anything out of. They then suddenly hear patterns of ringing noises coming from the tracks, and it turns out to be Morse code Zenjiro would use to contact Shizuru every day at 5pm. Shizuru can't quite figure it out fast enough, so Akira takes the reins to tell Zenjiro the water level is too high where they're at. He tells them to get to higher ground, but before he can answer which direction to go, he turns back to his useless form. And unfortunately, it looks like a huge wave is headed towards the girls. They run back into the train and drive in the opposite direction, and narrowly escaping the sweeping waters. Making it to a place of safety, Shizuru stares back at the destroyed tracks, knowing there's no way they can go back home now. With no place to go but forward, they press onward, reaching their first town of Higashi Agano, and they're greeted by people with mushrooms on their heads? We turn back time to Yoka's first day at school. Shizuru had accidentally bumped into her desk, and despite Yoka having hid her face the whole day, the girls were finally able to see it. They all introduced themselves to the new girl, and of course, Akira introduced Raimi as flunking Raimi, while welcoming the shy Yoka warmly. Back to the present, the people of Higashi Agano are surprised to see the train, as they hadn't seen one in ages. They know Agano is quite a ways away from them, so they're glad to hear everyone is doing fine over there, despite them all being animals. With Higashi Agano's declining population, they luckily have plenty of housing. Nautica remarks that unfortunately, they don't have much money to afford a place to stay, which makes the people eerily all turn towards her at once, with the main girl mentioning money's no problem here at all. However, Akira doesn't take this news so positively. In the town, the girls find the people here so friendly as opposed to back at home, where it's carnivores versus herbivores. Uh, not in a predator versus prey way, but over what shrine offerings should be used. When Akira mentions they should have just used Agano's specialties like bitter melon, their town guide, Matsuta, reacts somewhat negatively, but brushes it off, trying to now say it's no big deal. They learn Matsuta used to live in Ikebukuro as well, but eventually moved back here, making Shizuru think of Yoka, remembering the time they took a picture together when Yoka had finished cutting her hair. In the evening, the girls are introduced to a luxurious place for staying, where Matsuta recommends using the mist sauna. Everyone uses it except Akira, who feels uncomfortable about undressing around all of them. Sitting by Pochi, Akira wonders if it was truly alright leaving home. She felt conflicted about it, but didn't want to be alone. She lies on Pochi and spots one of the town's residents creepily watching her. Then, Matsuta arrives, bringing several plates of food, all containing mushrooms, something that Akira doesn't seem too fond of. After Matsuta takes her leave though, Akira is startled to see a second resident appear next to the first one that was watching her. But when the girls arrive back from the sauna, the two men disappear. As they're about to dig in, Akira stops them, bringing up the fact that this whole town seems weird, especially the mushrooms on their heads. However, the girls pay Akira's concern no mind. During sleep time, Akira wakes up to use the restroom. She wonders why there's a sauna so close but the bathroom is so far. She stops to faintly hear some of the residents say, Finally, some new blood. As she makes her way with Pochi to where she hears the residents speaking, they utter that outsiders are so dumb, they fall for anything. Akira backs up, but accidentally steps on Pochi's tail causing him to shriek, alerting the townsfolk. While running, the mushrooms on the heads of the townsfolk stretch and pursue her like an otherworldly horror. Akira trips and tumbles, but luckily, Shizuru and the rest of the girls find her. Matsuta comes out of the dark and back at their stay, assures them the unfamiliar surroundings must have given Akira a bad dream, and the girls buy it, while Matsuta leaves with an ominous look. The next day, as the girls continue to ignore Akira's pleas to leave, Pochi starts repeatedly barking at them. They head over to the train where the bitter melon seems to have overgrown. As Raimi takes a bite, the Higashi townsfolk seem to shudder in fear at the fruit. Matsuta doesn't seem to like a bitter melon. She hates the idea of a fruit that thrives in the hot scorching sun. She goes on an unhinged rant that the world went haywire thanks to life that prefers warm climates and sunlight. And after telling them to tear off all the bitter melon, she leaves with complete feelings of disgust. Shizuru tells them Akira is on divining duty with her, 
sending Raimi and Nadako to go shop for supplies in town. However, Akira freaks out, worried about their two friends, and runs to town looking to find them. Wandering the eerie town, she sees a man suddenly fall with the mushrooms on his head pulsate. She runs, meeting her friends who get supplies from Matsuta, and finds that her friends seem to want to stay here in Higashi. Back at the train, they find Shizuru didn't finish pruning the bitter melon. She seems unmotivated for some reason, questioning if they can even truly make it to Ikebukuro. She suddenly passes out, and Akira freaks out seeing the mushroom on her head, on all of her friends' heads. The 5 o'clock alarm rings and Akira communicates it back and forth with Zenjiro, explaining the situation. He mentions that mushrooms like dark, moist places, but before he can fully explain how to deal with them, he turns back to his useless form, causing Akira to lose her mind. Then the townsfolk suddenly surround Akira, telling her life as a mushroom is the only way. She heads back into the train, trying to convince her friends to move, but it's no use. With Shizuru now unconvinced Yoka is worth saving, she mentions that she never understood Yoka to begin with. Reflecting on the past, Yoka even then wanted to move to Ikebukuro. Then, regaining the will to go find her friend, Shizuru rips the mushroom off of her head, feigning that she had lost all her memories of everyone, which frustrates Akira. As the townsfolk hit the train and holler at them to stop, Shizuru and Akira rip the mushrooms off of their remaining friends' heads, bringing them back to their senses. Pochi then signals to use the bitter melon, so Shizuru runs out, combating all the townspeople. She attempts to rip the mushroom off of Matsuta's head in order to save her, but turns out she and the rest of the townsfolk are not actually being controlled like they were. They chose the path of the mushroom, knowing it would kill them after two years. Matsuta believes Shizuru's journey to be pointless, praying that she choke on her food and die. And with that, the girls continued their journey to find their missing friend, barely thanking Akira. Man, the mushroom people were pretty freaky. Like this video and subscribe to my channel for more. Also, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.